Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Coping Side Effects Related to Uterine Cancer Treatments. I'm Kitty Silverman, the Uterine Cancer Program Director of SHARE. And I'm Corby Arthur, SHARE's Uterine Cancer Patient Support Coordinator and a uterine cancer patient myself. Before the presentation begins, I'd like to tell you a little bit about SHARE. We're a national nonprofit that supports, educates, and empowers anyone diagnosed with breast or gynecologic cancers and provides outreach to the general public about signs and symptoms. For more information about upcoming webinars, support groups, podcasts, and our helplines, please visit our website at sharecancersupport.org. Now I'd like to hand it over to Jessica Waljonski to introduce Jessica, I mean, to introduce herself. The screen is yours, Jessica. Hi, thanks so much. My name is Jessica Walchonsky, and I am a physician assistant at UCLA in the gynecologic oncology department. And I'm really excited to be participating in this webinar today. Thanks for everyone for joining. And of course, thanks to the whole SHARE team for putting on these webinars and also just for everything that you do for patients and all of your support. Um, so I'm going to share my screen so we can get started. Okay, so today, of course, I'm going to talk about how to cope with side effects related to uterine cancer treatments. So let's get started. So I wanted to start off by talking about some stats in uterine cancer. So it is the most common gynecologic cancer in the United States and the sixth most common female cancer worldwide. So this is a very prevalent cancer. Um, we have many patients, we have many survivors with this diagnosis. This year, it is estimated there will be almost 68,000 new diagnoses of uterine cancer. So most cases are diagnosed between the ages of 45 and 74. And the reason that all of this is so important and really talking about treatment management and all of these interventions with symptoms is because there is a growing number of cancer survivors. We have better treatment options. People are living longer. People are doing very well. Um, and so we really need good interventions to help manage these symptoms so we can just get you guys feeling a lot better. So I want to start off by doing a quick summary on different treatment options in uterine cancer. So most patients will undergo surgery. So we almost always will do removal of the uterus, which we call a hysterectomy. And we oftentimes will also remove your ovaries and your fallopian tube. So that's an oophorectomy and a salpingectomy. Sometimes we will also remove nearby lymph nodes, so a lot of pelvic lymph nodes. And this is called a lymphadenectomy or a sentinel lymph node dissection. After surgery, sometimes before surgery, just depending on the person, depending on the exact diagnosis, a lot of patients will undergo chemotherapy. There are numerous different chemotherapy agents that we can use. Um, important to note, too, that uterine cancer chemotherapy is very different from other chemotherapies used in other cancer treatments. Um, so I know sometimes we get patients who are on support groups or they have friends and you know maybe they have a colon cancer, maybe they have a lung cancer. Um, we don't always use the same chemotherapy agents. So just important to kind of always keep that in the back of your mind. There are many, many agents out there. Radiation therapy is also very common in uterine cancer. So we'll kind of briefly touch on this a little bit too later, but the two types that we normally give are external beam radiation and then also brachytherapy. Some patients will receive hormonal therapy. So this could be either an anti-estrogen medication or a progesterone medication. And then there's things like immunotherapy. So immunotherapies would be things like pembrolizumab, gestarlimab. These are medications that really rev up your immune system to hopefully fight off any cancer cells. Uh, this is not an all-inclusive list, but these are just kind of the most common treatments that we see for uterine cancer, and these are kind of what we're going to touch on today. So I also want to kind of briefly go over the female reproductive system here. I think that it's very helpful when talking about side effects and kind of managing side effects. So you can see here on the left-hand side in the picture of the pelvis that I have. So the uterus, of course, is the pear-shaped organ right in the middle of our pelvis. The bladder sits right on top of it. Um, and that is usually what is removed with uterine cancer treatment and many other gynecologic cancers. So when we remove the uterus, oftentimes the cervix comes with it. The cervix is going to be the opening of the uterus. There are special cases where the cervix might stay in place, but usually the cervix will come out with the uterus. When we remove the cervix, we suture the very top or the very back of the vagina. 
And that is what we call the vaginal cuff, C-U-F-F. So this is really important because a lot of times you'll hear your team talking about, you know, your vaginal cuff and this and that. And sometimes people don't have any idea um, what their oncologists are talking about or what their team's talking about. So we remove the cervix, it forms the vaginal cuff. And of course the vagina is the opening. Um, and then you can see the ovaries and the fallopian tubes, which tend to also come out with these uterine cancer treatments, but not always. And then radiation therapy, just kind of briefly wanted to touch on the two ways that we do it. Like I said, so one is brachytherapy, which you can kind of see on the left-hand side there. Brachytherapy is where radiation oncologists will use applicators and insert it into your uterus to really kind of deliver targeted radiation to the area. The other type of radiation is external beam, which is that bottom right picture, which is almost more like an x-ray. <clears throat> so imagine it, you know, it is a targeted area, but a little bit more widespread than brachytherapy would be. So some patients will get one or the other, some will get both. It just depends, again, on your pathology and your specific diagnosis. So now that we kind of did that brief summary, I really want to get into side effect management, the reasons that we're all here. So really important, and I'm going to say this over and over again today, please, please talk to your team. We are here to help. We can only help with symptoms if we know about them. So when you come in for your visits, you know, whether it's every three weeks, every three months, you know, however often you're coming in, we tend to ask patients and women about the most common side effects, or we make assumptions as to what side effects we think you're going to be experiencing or feeling, but we're not always right. And so really, if you have symptoms that are bothering you, if you have symptoms that seem weird or a little bit off, please bring it up to us so we can help. Um, I get a lot of patients who come in and they'll say, you know, I, I'm a little embarrassed. Like I, I feel weird bringing this up or I, you know, sent you this message and I didn't know how you would respond. Judgment-free zone. So we are here to help with any symptoms, whether it's emotional health, physical health, sexual health. This is what we're here for. And I always tell patients, it's not complaining, it's just reporting. So please, you're never a bother, but this is how we can help you really, really feel a lot better and manage your symptoms. So let's get into it. I'm going to start with fatigue. Fatigue is so common, um, definitely with uterine cancer treatments. It's common in life. Um, and it's also a really, really hard symptom for us to treat. Um, it's really hard to kind of monitor. It's hard to figure out what exactly is causing it. And that's because there are so many potential contributing factors. So we know that fatigue, of course, can be a side effect of cancer. It can be a side effect of your treatment, but it can also be, you know, if you're a little bit anemic, maybe your red blood cells are a little bit low, maybe your hemoglobin is a little bit low from treatment or from diet or whatever it may be, that can make us feel really fatigued. Any emotional distress, so if you're feeling, you know, anxiety or worry or panic, that can contribute to fatigue. Maybe you're not sleeping well. So of course, if you're not sleeping well at night, maybe it's from insomnia, maybe it's pain from surgery. Again, maybe there's a worry piece to it. Of course, we're going to feel more tired in the daytime too. Low appetite or poor diet. Maybe you're currently on treatment and you really have no, no appetite, or maybe you're really nauseous and you're not eating as well. So that can contribute Deconditioning is also a really, really big one. So when we have surgery, you know, right after surgery, your team tells you to rest and take it easy and you're recovering, um, which is very important. But during that time, we sometimes will lose some muscle mass and we become a little deconditioned. This can happen during treatment too. So imagine if you're having, you know, daily radiation treatments or infusions that are frequent, you have all these doctor's appointments. And that can actually be exhausting. And that can also lead us to become a little bit deconditioned. And then I added here too, of course, life in general. So I think that when we have cancer diagnoses, we focus so much on like the treatment and the labs and all the medical things. But what about just life? What about friend relationships and family relationships and work um, and financial issues? And so all of these things can contribute to fatigue. And so... Really important to talk to your team so they can figure out which one of these factors, um, if not all of them, are contributing because treatment really does depend on the cause. Um, and fatigue is really important because it really can last months, but sometimes years after a diagnosis or after a treatment. And so it's something that your team really should be frequently checking in with. Um, so that way we can just get you feeling better and a little bit more energized. So talking about some management options for fatigue, 
So one really big one, and you'll hear me talk about this a lot today, is activity enhancement. So this is exercise. So we know that exercise has been shown to combat fatigue and really help. Um, so we really want to focus on doing regular exercise. So this way we can improve our strength, our energy, our fitness. So the American Cancer Society recommends at least 150 minutes of exercise per week. So you should incorporate strength training and also cardio exercise or aerobic exercise. And this really improves our overall mobility, our physical function. Um, but studies have shown that even consistent, moderate walking has been shown to help with so many side effects related to treatment. And so I'm not sitting here telling you, you know, to go from zero to a hundred, you don't have to go out and run three miles today. You don't have to go to the gym and start, you know, doing CrossFit. Um, I really want you to find something that you enjoy so you can get creative with it. You know, even if you're gardening, I mean, that might be something you could do like a gentle yoga workout. You could do bar workouts are really great. So kind of finding something that you think is fun. And so that way it doesn't feel so much like a chore. Um, again, we're usually so busy with doctor's appointments and, and treatment appointments and all these things. So we don't want to add another chore to, to your list. We want you to really enjoy what you're doing. Um, your team can also consider a referral to physical therapy. I love physical therapy. I think they're really great to get on board early on. They can focus on a whole body deconditioning, uh, but they can also kind of target specific muscle groups too. And so they have a lot of really great recommendations. Also, never too late to start. So we know that exercise really can contribute a lot to overall longevity and help us, you know, decrease cardiovascular risks and metabolic syndrome risks and heart disease and all of these things that are so important. And so again, I'm not telling you to go out and do anything crazy when it comes to exercise, but gradually getting into it, working with your team, maybe to come up with, with some appropriate and reasonable activity goals for yourself, I think is a really good place to start. Turning kind of more so to psychosocial intervention, so a little bit different from the exercise, um, things like cognitive behavioral therapy, so with a therapist is really, really great. Um, support groups, we love our support groups, we think that they're so important, and just a really great way to hear other people's, you know, thoughts and opinions, and maybe hear some things that you wouldn't have thought of otherwise. Um, journaling is great, different art and music therapies relaxation techniques are really important. So mindfulness and cognitive behavioral therapy are actually the two um, like really scientifically proven options to help with fatigue management when looking at psychosocial interventions. So if you can pick two things from this category to help with your fatigue, therapy is going to be really important. And then mindfulness and really learning how to relax your body I also want to point out that mindfulness and meditation, a lot of people think that that means, you know, you're sitting here in your body, you have zero thoughts. Um, and that's not what it is. What mindfulness and meditation means is that you're sitting there listening to your thoughts, listening to how your body feels in a no judgment way. So even if you're stressed and even if you're anxious and if your brain is thinking about a million different things, that's okay, but recognizing how you're feeling. So then you can go back to, you know, your therapist or your support group or your journaling and kind of talk through these feelings and these emotions that you're feeling. Um, again, listen to your body and what it needs. Maybe you started a really great exercise program, but then you're just really tired and your muscles are sore and you're, you're even more fatigued than before. And so maybe take a break that day, rest when you need it. That's also very important. Prioritizing tasks. I think this is also really key. So I think really important when we're so busy, when we are having low energy, important to really do your high energy tasks when you have the most energy. So if you wake up at 8 a.m., you're like prime energy at 9 a.m., that's when you should be doing all of those kind of heavier tasks. And then spending your energy on activities that make you happy. I think this is so important. I think that a lot of times women before cancer diagnoses tend to be caregivers and you know they're spread very thin and they're taking care of everyone and trying to do a million things at once and that can sometimes change when we have cancer treatment um, or a cancer diagnosis and now it's okay to focus a little bit more on yourself and what you need and it's okay to say no to things um, and it's okay to really do things that you think are important to you and that will also actually help with fatigue management as well. 
So now moving on to sleep hygiene. So again, if you're not sleeping well at night, we're bound to be really fatigued the next day. Um, so really big things, avoiding screen time. I really recommend at least three hours before bed, but I think one hour is a good place to start. If you are going to be on screens before a bed, using blue light blocking glasses are really great. Um, really developing a wind down bedtime routine. Our bodies are actually creatures of routine. Um, and so when you have a set wind down schedule, you know, every night I'm going to brush my teeth at this time, wash my face at this time, shower, go to bed at this time, um, your body will actually start recognizing these things um, as a bedtime routine, and it should actually increase your fatigue at night. Using the restroom before bed, we don't want to be waking up, of course, multiple times throughout the night, urinating. Sometimes we can't help it, but limiting liquids as much as we can before bed. Um, keeping your bedroom cool, very important for both sleep hygiene. It can help with hot flashes too, which we'll get into later. Um, avoiding spicy foods, alcohol. We really don't want to be drinking alcohol before bed. I would say the latest that you really should be drinking alcohol is probably 6 p.m., maybe earlier. So people sometimes confuse drowsiness from alcohol as being very tired and ready for bed when actually it's not it's not restful sleep when you're drinking alcohol. So trying to limit alcohol intake, um, really we should try to avoid eating also a few hours before bed as well. Meditation, gentle yoga, all great things to calm the body down. Then there are supplements that you can do to help sleep. So magnesium, calcium, melatonin, they're all great options. Then there are a few herbs that you could try as well too. There's also like sleepy time teas and chamomile. So those are great options to try also. Dietary modifications, I think, are so important. So really focusing on nourishing your body. If you're not getting good protein intake, nutrient intake, you're going to be fatigued. And we know that. And that's in the whole population. Um, so I also wanted to mention here, because I think it's a great way to kind of sneak it in, but sugar does not make your cancer grow. And it also doesn't make it go away. The problem with sugar intake is that being overweight and carrying excess weight does increase many different health risks. And so while, yes, sugar doesn't necessarily, you know, impact your cancer and your cancer care, it does impact many other things. So really kind of focusing on protein, iron, well-rounded foods, anti-inflammatory diet. So kind of avoiding things like dairy, avoiding things like gluten, things like that can also help us feel better. Supplements are really great if you're deficient, um, but actually our bodies absorb um, all of these vitamins and stuff more so if it comes from food as opposed to oral pills and things like that. Um, so definitely talk to your team if you're wanting to start a supplement or if you think that maybe you need a supplement. So just some other things that I wanted to mention for managing fatigue. So ginseng um, daily actually has been shown to help. There are small studies, but it has been shown to help kind of combat cancer-related and treatment-related fatigue. So that could be something you could consider starting. Acupuncture, I think, is great for so many different reasons. Um, so you could talk to an acupuncturist. There are some medications, so psychostimulants, that really can increase our energy as well, too. So talking to your team if that maybe is an option for you. Referral to palliative care. I love this one, and I really want to touch on this one for a moment. Um, a lot of people hear palliative care, and they think that that means hospice, and they think that that means end-of-life care, which 100% palliative care does do those things. Um, but they're also, the other thing that they do is really, really manage symptoms related to cancer and symptoms related to treatment. And so I actually love getting palliative care on board really from the time of diagnosis. They can come on board obviously at any time, but I like getting them on sooner rather than later because they have all these other kind of tips and tricks up their sleeve and they can really help manage physical symptoms of treatments and cancer diagnoses, but also kind of emotional and more of the mental health as well. So they're really, really great to kind of help combat all of these symptoms. And then obviously a referral to nutritionist or dietitian can help. Maybe you need, you know, some more ideas for what foods to eat, what foods to avoid. So they can really kind of be helpful as well too. Really, I think cancer care, the big thing is a multidisciplinary approach. So that is where we kind of use many different experts in many different fields to really kind of give you the best treatment and also get you feeling as best as we possibly can and help manage all of these symptoms. So now moving on to emotional distress. 
very common in a lot of our patients, of course. And so a lot of times you will hear things like anxiety, depression, distress, fear of recurrence, really hard time moving forward sometimes, um, and hypervigilance. So I'm sure a lot of people say, you know, especially when you're finishing treatment, maybe you're, maybe you're on surveillance mode now where you're not on a treatment, you know, maybe you're just being monitored every three months, every six months. And I'm sure a lot of people can relate that you feel a symptom and you just hyper-focus on it. And, you know, we can have bowel abnormalities for so many reasons and bloating for so many reasons and, you know, a little bit of discomfort for so many reasons, but being hyper-vigilant with all of this, we hear all the time. Um, and then really body image and self-esteem. If you had surgery, maybe you had radiation, you know, maybe you are now menopausal and you weren't before. And so maybe things look different, things feel different. And so it can take time kind of adjusting to that um, as well. It, it really is almost your new body. You know, I, I've heard a lot of women say, even if things physically look fine on the outside, people sometimes it does emotionally affect them saying, well, I don't have a uterus anymore. I don't have ovaries anymore. And it, it sometimes makes me feel less of a woman. And then you get other women and they're like, yes, take it all out. Now I don't have to worry. But there are many different feelings and emotions surrounding surgery and things like that. So also just like I keep saying, talk to your team so we can talk you through it. Um, and just being patient with yourself during this time. Maybe really hard to get back into dating or relationships and intimacy. Again, that goes with, you know, the anxiety, the fear of recurrence, all of that, but also kind of the body image as well. And then returning to work and financial hardship. I think this is one that a lot of us as, you know, GYN oncologists don't really focus on enough, to be honest. Um, and we don't think about it as much, but medical bills are expensive. And a lot of times people are off of work for long periods of time while they're on treatment. Um, and then you finish treatment and maybe you're back to work. And now it's so different because now you have these side effects you're dealing with. Um, you know, do coworkers know? Do they not know? You know, maybe you still have all these frequent doctor's appointments. Um, so this is a big one too, that if you are struggling with, please also talk to your team. All of this emotional distress really can persist for many years following diagnosis. There's been studies that show that it really can last up to 10 years. And that's a significant period of time. Um, family members, of course, can be impacted. Family members, caregivers, friends, your whole support system can also be impacted by this. Um, so just knowing about resources for yourself, but then also knowing about resources that are available for other people in your life who may be affected. So things that we can do for emotional distress. So of course, addressing any contributing factors. Emotional distress is another one. There's so many things that could be kind of causing it. And so pain, of course, if you're having significant pain, that can lead to a little bit of depression, maybe a little bit of anxiety. Um, so treating that, sleep, you know, medical comorbidity. So maybe you, maybe your treatment gave you neuropathy, but maybe you also have a history of diabetes and you have neuropathy from that. And now you're really struggling. Um, and that can really affect our emotional health and our mental health. So just kind of treating all of these factors. Acupuncture, again, it can be great. Maintaining a steady blood sugar is also really important. So if your blood sugar is dropping, it actually can cause you to become very irritable, which can then also lead to distress and anxiety. It's kind of like a vicious cycle, all of these things. Um, so eating small frequent meals throughout the day is important and incorporating healthy fats, protein, omega-3s are really important. Um, and then just getting your body moving again. So yoga, exercising, meditation, socialization is also really important um, for emotional health and mental health, health therapy. So again, talking to a social worker, talking to a psychologist, a psychiatrist, all really great options. And then if you are really struggling, there are many medications out there that you can discuss with your team, many medications to help with um, depression and also anxiety. So now switching gears, um, I know this is a lot of information, so I'm kind of moving quickly, um, but I just want to cover a lot of things here. But moving to hot flashes, so I'm sure a lot of us know what hot flashes are, kind of these um, sensations of heat, all of a sudden, intense sweating, flushing. We usually also will get anxiety and heart palpitations that come along with it. Hot flashes are experienced by so many women, over 75% of women, and then I just want to briefly mention natural menopause versus surgical menopause. So natural menopause occurs um, 
the the average age of menopause in this country is about 51 52 so that's where our ovaries um stop producing and stop making so much estrogen our estrogen levels drop we stop having periods um, and then that is a natural menopause surgical menopause means you are still having normal periods um you know you were younger than that average age of menopause and then we went in we removed your ovaries and now we put you in surgical menopause um, so very, very similar, if not exactly the same symptoms, if it's natural menopause or a surgical menopause. Other risk factors that can contribute to hot flashes, smoking, um, obesity, and then certain races are at an increased risk too. So really decreasing any smoking. I mean, smoking is detrimental to your health for so many reasons. So I encourage anybody who's smoking to try to stop or decrease your smoking habits. Um, but then obesity. So again, exercising is going to be really helpful with hot flashes too. Um, lifestyle changes. So again, keeping your room very cool. We really want to avoid things that are going to rev up the immune system. And so um, avoiding caffeine, alcohol, spicy foods. So things also like anxiety and things that really kind of get us, you know, bothered or, or upset, things like that are actually going to make hot flashes a lot worse. And so kind of staying calm, avoiding things that are going to cause an increase in our nervous system. Weight loss, like I mentioned, some natural remedies that we can try that are really great. So aromatherapy can work. So things like lavender, sandalwood, you can get oils to put, you know, behind your ear. Um, you could put it on your wrists. You could get um, spray bottles to kind of spritz on your pillow before bed or a diffuser. Many, many ways that you could do aromatherapy. Acupuncture, yoga is really great, again, because it calms down the nervous system mindfulness, meditation, black cohosh, that is an over-the-counter supplement um, that actually has similar effects to estrogen. So it has been shown to improve hot flashes as well, but important to talk to your team and just make sure that black cohosh is safe for you um, with your history. There are many prescription medications that we can give for hot flashes also. Hormone replacement therapy, so that would be things like estrogen. So a systemic estrogen, like a pill or a patch, there's also vaginal estrogen, which is not systemic. Vaginal estrogen works just on the vaginal tissue. Vaginal estrogen, which we'll talk about later too, is not going to help with hot flashes. Systemic estrogen can help with hot flashes, uh, but systemic hormone therapy is not safe for everyone. So really important to talk to your team and see if it's an option for you. There are other medications. So antidepressants actually have been shown to help with hot flashes too. So that's things like paroxetine, venlafaxine. Gabapentin was actually originally um, creative as an anti-seizure medication, but we use gabapentin all the time in, in the GYN oncology world. And so it's great for pain. It's really great for hot flashes. The nice thing too about gabapentin is that there's a wide range of dosing. So we can really work on finding the right dose for you to help with hot flashes, but also limiting side effects. Vioza um, is a new medication on the market. It is prescription. Um, it was just newly FDA approved, um, non-hormonal. It's a daily pill. So that's also another option to talk to your team about to see if that's an option for you. So now switching gears to neuropathy. So neuropathy, of course, is that burning, numbness, tingling. Um, it's usually going to be in your hands and fingers and your feet and toes. So really the incidence of neuropathy depends on what treatment you have, um, how long were you on the treatment? So it's very different for everyone. Neuropathy does tend to gradually improve over time. So really being patient is going to help. Um, but some of it can kind of linger and be permanent. So while we're on a treatment, we really try to ask about neuropathy frequently because if it's getting really significant, we might want to decrease your dose. We might want to delay your treatment a little bit um, because some of it can be permanent. Things, though, that can help with neuropathy, so heat or cryotherapy, um, cryotherapy like ice gloves and ice socks can be really good while we're actually on treatment. Uh, but after treatment, if you're still struggling with struggling with neuropathy, using heat or, or ice therapy can also actually feel really, really good and stimulate some of the blood flow back into the area. Exercise, again, has been shown to help with neuropathy, physical therapy, acupuncture. So I normally say we have our East West medicine at UCLA that does acupuncture and massage and acupressure. I normally tell all my patients, 
bring in a list, like literally write down a list of every single symptom that you're feeling, bring it into the acupuncturist's office and see what they can help with. Um, Cause they actually can help with a lot more things that, that people even know about. Um, so just recommend doing that. If you go in to see someone massaging the area can help. So massaging your hands, massaging your feet. Maybe you have a partner who can massage your feet. Um, there are different supplements. So things like these are over the counter, but things like alpha lipoic acid, glutamine, vitamin B6, those can all help prevent neuropathy while you're on treatment, but can also be used after you're finished with treatment to kind of help resolve some of um, those symptoms. It is important to note that with vitamin B, if your levels, so vitamin B helps with neuropathy. However, if your vitamin B levels are too high, it can actually make neuropathy worse. So if you have been taking vitamin B for a while and you're still having significant neuropathy, doesn't hurt to ask, you know, primary care or your oncology team, you know, just ask someone to check a quick vitamin B level and see if you're really high, it might help to actually remove the vitamin B um, from your daily regimen. There are also prescription medications. So duloxetine um, is a great medication. Gabapentin, again, can help a lot with neuropathy, can help with hot flashes. And then medications like pregabalin, amtriptyline, they're just other medications that you can talk to your team about um, if these other kind of more natural, holistic things are not working. So now switching gears to urinary symptoms. Um, so a lot of times these will come with radiation treatment. And so what we see often with radiation is what we call radiation cystitis. So we know that when we radiate to, when we give radiation to the pelvis, it can irritate. Remember, the bladder sits right on top of the uterus. So the radiation can also hit the bladder and cause a lot of inflammation and even some scarring of the bladder lining. So radiation works by kind of interrupting cancer cells' DNA, and so they can't replicate um, they can't multiply. The problem though, is that the radiation also will hit some normal cells. And so that is when we start developing symptoms. So it decreases blood flow to the area. And then some of these normal cells can be affected. Um, so with radiation cystitis, a lot of symptoms that people will experience can be discomfort with urination. It can be urgency. Um, so, you know, as soon as you get the feeling that you have to urinate, you have to run to the restroom. Frequency, sometimes blood in the urine. So a lot of people will actually think that they have a urinary tract infection. We'll check the urine, you know, we'll do the workup and it's negative. It really is just kind of what we call this radiation cystitis. Some women will also experience urinary incontinence. Many potential causes, of course, for incontinence. So it, it can be part of radiation. It can be part of surgery. Um, if you've had vaginal deliveries, it can be related to that. As we lose estrogen too, it can be related to that. So just important, that one really depends on the cause and the treatments are different depending on the cause, um, but your team can help you kind of maneuver around that. But some recommendations for these symptoms. So NSAIDs, so things like ibuprofen and things like that actually can help a lot, especially if you're having a lot of discomfort um, with urination. Cranberry juice is great. Azo, um, Azo works great for kind of all of the symptoms that go with UTIs. I'm sure people have been on them when they've had urinary tract infections in the past. It works a lot with symptom management. So that's a really great option. Increasing hydration is really good for a lot of reasons, uh, but it should help a little bit with these radiation changes, kind of flushing everything out. Bladder irrigation is occasionally an option. Um, so people who are noticing a lot of blood in their urine, sometimes the team can go in and kind of just irrigate and wash out the bladder. And this just removes any kind of old blood clots, um, or if there's any abnormal tissue or scarring, we can kind of remove that at the same time as well. And then prescription medications. So there are um, anti-spasmodic medications that can also really help with the urgency and the frequency that we see. Um, so a lot of really good options, but just talk to your team to see about what might be the best option for you. Moving on to GI symptoms. So very, very common constipation, diarrhea. I hear these things, of course, all the time. So regardless if you're having constipation or diarrhea, really important to stay hydrated. So if you're having constipation, hydration will kind of help soften the stool and help it move through your bowels a little bit more easily. And then of course, if you're having diarrhea, we can actually become dehydrated very quickly. So really important, either, either um, symptom that you might be experiencing to just be really increasing your water intake, increasing activity, walking that helps, especially for constipation. It can help get things moving as well. 
if you're having a lot of constipation, prune juice, hot water with lemon, coffee, um, there's teas out there. So like smooth move and things like that can help with bowels. If you're having a lot of diarrhea, important to stick to a bland diet. So we use a lot of times what's called the brat diet. So it's bananas, rice, applesauce, and toast. I mean, that tends to be really, really bland and the bowels can tolerate it well, just kind of while things get back on track. Um, there are a lot of over-the-counter medications that can help. So we have so many kind of tips and tricks up our sleeve, depending on what you've tried and what is and isn't working. Um, so again, talk to your team. Senna's great. Miralax is great if you're having a lot of constipation, um, docusate, diarrhea, things like Imodium. We can sometimes prescribe Lamotol. So a lot of different things to try. Um, there are prescription medications if you need them, if you get to that point. And sometimes we will refer to GI if we think that maybe it's not necessarily from treatment or maybe we're still having a really hard managing it. Sometimes we'll get GI on board as well too to kind of help a little bit more. So sexual health, I love this little um, photo that I got from, it's called meetrosie.com and we'll talk about it. But this is a really great picture that just describes how many different things contribute to sexual health and sexual wellness. So we're not really going to go into all of these today, but just important to remember that if you are struggling with sexual health, um, it's probably multifactorial and we probably really have to kind of dive in deep and see exactly which one of these puzzle pieces are contributing. So I wanted to start with dyspareunia when we talk about sexual health. So dyspareunia is going to be pain with intercourse and there's a couple different causes. Um, so you can see here, I have in this picture what a healthy vagina on the left looks like. So you can see that vaginal tissue is very thick. It's pink. We see a lot of rugae, which are kind of these ridges in the vaginal walls, um, very elastic. And so this is what a healthy vagina looks like, not menopausal. Uh, but then you see on the right hand side, what atrophy looks like. And atrophy is going to be this thinning of the vaginal tissue. Um, the tissue becomes whiter in appearance. There's less blood flow to the area. We can have um, kind of easily bleeding areas. So areas that can spot a little bit more easily. And we do lose a lot of elasticity. This can shorten the vaginal canal a little bit. Um, and of course can cause some discomfort. And so when we have a lot of atrophy, what happens is that we feel a lot of burning, itching, dryness, and this may be during intercourse, but this also might just be on a day-to-day. -day. So sometimes it, it can be described as like an overall awareness of your vagina. So, you know, you're just like out at the grocery store and you're like, feels kind of weird down there. Like I, I'm just noticing it. And that might mean that you have atrophy and there are things that we can help. Um, so recommendations, I love vaginal moisturizers. So I always compare vaginal moisturizers kind of to our face. So I'm sure all of us moisturize our face probably at least once or twice a day. We've been doing it since we were young. We never think though about moisturizing our vagina and it's so important. So I recommend getting, at least starting with a non-hormonal over-the-counter moisturizer and I'll list a few at the end, um, but there's a million out there. But finding a vaginal moisturizer, using it three times a week at bedtime. And then if there's any left in the morning, you know, just wipe it away. But this will really add moisture back into the vaginal tissue and those vaginal walls. Moisturizers then are different than lubricants. So they work differently. So lubricants, I want you to use during intercourse or during, you know, intimate moments. Um, you know, intimacy is not just penetrative intercourse, um, but using a lubricant during intimacy is really important. So lubricants will kind of make things smoother, whereas moisturizers are really meant to be kept in the vagina. So the vaginal walls can really absorb that into the tissue. Um, there are a lot of CBD infused lubricants, which a lot of women do like. CBD infused lubricants are great during intercourse. Um, they help increase blood flow to the area, improve relaxation. And so I did list one here, Foria tends to be one that I've heard a lot of women really liking. And so that might be a good option um, for some women. Vaginal estrogen cream, we know helps with vaginal dryness. We know helps with atrophy. But again, talk to your team to see if it's an option for you or not. And then increasing hydration. So if you're dehydrated, that actually can contribute to atrophy as well too. So again, increasing water intake will be super important. So then looking um, at other causes of dyspareunia, so vaginal stenosis can also cause discomfort. Um, and so that's going to be a shortening or a narrowing of your vaginal canal. This can happen from radiation. This can happen if you've had multiple 
um, excisional procedures, so multiple vaginal um, or cervical procedures that lead to scar tissue. And so a couple really great things that we can do for stenosis. Um, so vaginal dilators are really important. Vaginal dilators help to keep the vaginal walls open and help decrease scar tissue um, or treat scar tissue. And so I, I know a lot of radiation offices will kind of give you these like medical grade looking dilators and they're plastic and they're not comfortable. And you don't have to use those. You can really get fun with it. There are silicone dilators on Amazon that I love. Um, so they come in all different colors and sizes. Um, you also could use a vibrator too. Like no one says that you have to use the dilators that radiation oncology gives you. Um, so try to get a little bit fun with it. You could use um, a CBD lubricant on the dilator. You could use the moisturizer on the dilator. Um, and using the dilators either in bed or in the shower, those are two great places to use them. Uh, but really important to kind of keep the vaginal walls open and limit that scar tissue. There's also something called the O-nut, um, which I actually have one here to, to show you if we have time at the end. But I also included a picture here. So O-nuts are these little silicone rings that you can put on a male partner so that way you have control over the depth of penetration. And so a lot of people might have discomfort or pain with deep penetration or back where that vaginal cuff or cervix is. That's a very common area to have some discomfort. And so the O-nut is really great because you are in control um, and it makes it a lot more enjoyable. And I've heard that male partners also like it and are fine with it. So definitely something to try with your partner. Um, and then pelvic floor physical therapy, I love PTs who focus on pelvic floor. Um, they will always say we're more than just Kegels. And so talk to your team about maybe putting in a referral to them. What they normally do is a bimanual or an exam with their hands on your first visit. And they really kind of target all of the pelvic floor muscles and see which muscles might be a little bit weaker. And then they'll give you exercises to do at home um, to kind of strengthen these different muscles. And that can help with a lot of things, um, but it can help with, you know, urinary incontinence. It can help with this dyspareunia or discomfort. It can help with um, vaginal spada, spasms, muscular spasms. So pelvic floor of PT, honestly, I think every woman in the world should, should undergo, uh, but definitely talk to your team to see if it might help with some symptoms that you're experiencing. Lastly, with sexual health um, and dyspareunia is the social and emotional piece. So like we kind of briefly mentioned before, maybe after treatment, maybe after surgery, you're not connecting with your body in the same way. Maybe you're not connecting with your partner in the same way you know, things that maybe felt good before feel different now, or maybe now they hurt, or maybe other things are more sensitive, but in a good way. And so really important to kind of work through this. Some people don't mind, right? Like some people don't have a sexual relationship and that's okay. Some people do want to have a sexual relationship and it really affects their quality of life or their relationships if they're not having it. So if it is something that's bothering you, Again, talk to your team to see what they recommend. I love, though, sex therapists, cognitive behavioral therapy. So you talking to a therapist yourself or even going to couples therapy with your partner. I think that all of these are really great options. You know, your oncology team, you know, the PAs, the NPs, all of us really can help. But these are people who are experts who are trained in it. So I think are also really good additions to the team. A lot of women will be on antidepressants or anxiety medications, which is great because they can help a lot with mood, but some of these medications can also decrease our libido. So talk to your team if you're not having um, libido where you want it to be and see if maybe it could be secondary to one of your medications and being patient with yourself. So things are going to get better um, with time. And right when you're finished with treatment or right when you're finished with surgery, you know, pain tends to be a little bit more, symptoms tend to be a little bit more, then they do tend to get better with time. So being patient, be open with your partner, finding new ways to be intimate. Um, Rosie App and OMG Yes are two really great resources that I recommend everyone check out. Rosie App, um, they have a website, but it's also an app that was developed by doctors and psychologists. And they talk a lot about um, sexual health pain, intimacy, and kind of maneuvering around all of these different pieces that come along with sexual health. And then omgs.com is a really great website. It was very, very well done um, by women who talk about their stories 
and kind of give you ideas for other things that maybe you could try um, if you are trying to be intimate with a, partner, with a partner but don't really know where to start. So that's really great. It gives you options for physically things to do, but also just kind of how to talk to partners and how to kind of transition through this time. Um, so those are two really great resources. Quickly, I want to talk about joint pain. Um, so many different causes. We know that treatment, especially those hormonal treatments, um, can cause joint pain, but it also could be arthritis, it could be injury, it could be overuse. Um, so important if you're having new joint pain, talk to your team. Different things that we can do for joint pain. So there are over-the-counter medications, of course, ibuprofen, acetaminophen, they can be great in the short term. Omega-3 foods are really great with decreasing inflammation. They also increase lubrication to joints. So they can be really important to add into your diet too. And I've listed a few examples. Limiting al alcohol again, limiting those inflammatory foods, decrease any smoking, um, exercise, exercise, so important. Um, it's really good for your joints. And then also it's important to strengthen the muscles around these joints and that can better help joints and then decrease any pain. Yoga is great. Acupuncture again is great. And then there are things over the counter like Voltaren gel and capsaicin cream. They work really well, especially if you just have, you know, a couple joints here and there that maybe are bothering you. But again, important to talk to your team. Maybe it's not related to your treatment. Um, maybe it is just arthritis or maybe it is an injury and you need a different treatment. Um, so just make sure that it's getting looked into if you're having joint pain. So additional resources, um, if anybody wants to screenshot this, I know this PowerPoint will also be up um, online, but these are just also a lot of great options that I kind of listed. Can't Make a Dream, I actually just recently found out about. Um, they started out for ovarian cancer patients, but they've now expanded to all different types of patients. And it actually is a camp where you do a lot of like outdoor activities, but there's workshops and there's presentations and it's just a really, really well thought out weekend. Um, and I think it's totally free too um, for survivors and for cancer patients. And so something to look into, Foundation for Women's Cancer has so many great resources for all different cancer types. Um, they have brochures and they have symptom management and survivorship tips and, you know, how to maneuver around all of these times and how to talk to your team. So feel free to check out the FWC's website, Rosie app we talked about, OMGS we talked about, Faria Wellness is that CBD lubricant that I mentioned, although there's many out there, um, you could use any of them. Moisturizer, so these are going to be the ones that I recommend three times or so a week at bedtime, so I've listed a few there. They're all non-hormonal, you can get them over the counter. Headspace app is a really great app that helps with mindfulness and meditation um, and just working on that because it can be really hard. You know, if you've never really meditated before um, or even if you have, it can be really challenging to get into it. Um, I know that from personal experience, so, but Headspace is great um, and it really kind of can help get you started. NCCN is the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. That's where providers and a lot of, I'm sure your, your um, provider teams go for guidelines and recommendations. There's trials. We get a lot of information from there. They also have really great um, sections for patients when it comes to symptom management. And again, how to talk to your team, how to talk to people in your life. Um, to your support system. So also something great to check out. Cancer.gov has so many resources. I did actually include um, this eating hints, which is great. It's this whole PDF where they talk about different things to eat and avoid before, during, and after cancer treatment. Uh, but their website has so many great options. So great to check out there too. And of course, you all already know about Share, um, but Share has so many resources. I didn't feel like I had to mention that because you're all here, um, but Share obviously has so many things too. And so my last final takeaway is so really important, please, please advocate for yourself and talk to your providers. We really can only help if we know how you're feeling. Again, we're just assuming symptoms that you might be feeling, but there's so many other symptoms that you could ex that you could be experiencing and we want to help. We want to improve your quality of life. Um, and we really want to get you feeling well after going through these cancer treatments. So definitely talk to us. Um, the second one is exercise. I'm pretty sure every single symptom that I mentioned today, exercise was in there somewhere. Um, you know, it improves all of these different treatment side effects. It is linked to overall longevity and life and really extending our life. And remember, it's never too late to start. Start small. You can gradually work your way up. Um, and then lastly, let's spread the word. So I encourage all of you today who are here, 
take one thing, at least one thing that you learn from this presentation and go tell a friend or tell a family member or tell a coworker. And this is how we're really going to see change. We need to spread awareness. We need more options. We need better interventions and better management for symptoms. And so the best way that we can kind of spread this knowledge is if every person just goes and tells at least one person. Um, and so let's just work on making a change. Let's work on getting the word out. And that is all that I have. So I went a little bit over time. I'm sorry, but now I'm happy to take any questions about anything. Thank you so much, Jessica. That was really terrific and so comprehensive that most of the questions we had were definitely covered. <laughs> so we'll just pick a handful from both the pre-submitted questions and uh, the live ones today. And you can still add in a question um, in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, and we'll just get to as many as we can. Um, so I did have one live question that related um, to your topic about um, the sexual uh, issues. Oh, somebody wrote, estering has major warning for uterine cancer. Should it be prescribed with pessary for vaginal dryness? So it's a good question. So that is a form of vaginal estrogen. And that is very, very specific to the patient, to your history, and exactly what kind of uterine cancer you had. So if you are somebody who does not have a history of cancer and you're using estrogen and you have a uterus, you likely also need progesterone. So we need both of those hormones together because when we use estrogen, there is an increased risk of endometrial cancer, of uterine cancer. However, if you are a patient that has a history of uterine cancer or endometrial cancer, um, vaginal estrogen preparations do actually tend to be safe um, in more women than we think. Um, and so important to talk to your team, but if you already have had your uterus removed, if it's safe with your history and other comorbidities, you could probably be on a vaginal estrogen, but you have to talk to your team because it really depends on, on you. No, that's great. Thank you. And I think it's wonderful how you covered so much because they're you do have a lot of solutions and um, you know, just really impressing upon people how important it is to, to talk to your team. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody asked about radiation-induced proctitis, rectal inflammation. What would be the best treatment for that? Yeah, and that one, that one can be another tough one, just like radiation cystitis can sometimes be, be tough. And so really getting a good bowel regimen will be important. And so if you're having a lot of abnormal, like really hard stool or really frequent stool, that can make it worse. Um, we can do sometimes different prescription medications also to kind of help decrease some of the um, inflammation and things like that. But I think the best start that you can do at home is really just managing your bowels, increasing your water intake, and then talking to your team to say, hey, is there a prescription medication that might help a little bit? There are many different um, like tips and tricks that we do have up our sleeve. Like we can combine, I'm not necessarily saying that this is for radiation proctitis, but for so many of these things that come with radiation, like we can combine some medications at like compounding pharmacies. Like there are many different things that we can try if we're not managing it. Um, but I think for you personally to do at home would be increase hydration and try to get really good management of your bowels. Thank you. Um, I know you talked about um, CIPN, um, chemo-induced um, uh, peripheral neuropathy. Are there any newer treatments um, for that? There's not. Um, and so this is another thing, and I, and I could talk about this forever, is that in women's health, we need so much more research, right? Like so much more needs to be done um, in GYN cancers and really just all of OBGYN and women's health as a whole. There's not new medications, but the medications that we do have tend to work pretty well. Um, you know, I know a lot of people like for gabapentin, for example, they're like, I don't want to be on a seizure medication. Like that's, it's not for neuropathy, but we can use all of these medications for off-label uses. We use these medications often. So whether it's gabapentin, whether it's, you know, one of the, um, one of the like antidepressants, things like that. Like we use these off-label all the time. We know that they're safe. Um, but I also want to 
encourage acupuncture. If you guys haven't tried that before, there's not great research on acupuncture working. Um, but from what I hear personally, and I deal with obviously so many women, um, we do actually see results with acupuncture. So not everyone, but some women do see um, an improvement with that. Thank you. And actually, this is a related question that, that came in. Somebody who's tried um, a lot of treatments that haven't worked for their CIPN, mm -hmm. and but they also live in a rural area. Um, so there's challenges to that. Um, mm -hmm. Are there some specific uh, places they should potentially look at online if they're not getting, you know, what they need from? Yeah, from it's a really good question. And I think it's, you know, it is a challenge. Sometimes I'm fortunate to be at UCLA where it's a big academic center and we have all these resources. I think looking at those um, websites that I listed earlier, so Foundation for Women's Cancer is great, NCCN, Share, I'm sure you guys have um, a lot of resources too, but what I find is helpful a lot in community centers or rural areas is you could do a lot of video visits probably with, with these other um, experts. And so, like I mentioned, palliative care. So a lot of times when we have neuropathy and we have symptoms that, you know, we've tried all the things and we still have no improvement, that is 100% where I'm like, if you haven't already met with, with palliative care, we should now, um, cause they really can kind of help with these complex symptoms, but also neurologists. So a lot of us think about neurologists being the brain and being like, you know, headaches and memory issues and things like that, which they are, but there are many neurologists who also will specialize actually in neuropathy. And so if you're in a rural area, it might be difficult for you to actually physically go in to see, you know, a palliative care doctor or a neurologist. Um, but probably just starting even with a video visit and see if they have any other recommendations for you. I think that might be a good place to start. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to turn over the last three, four, mm -hmm. five minutes if we go over a tiny bit over to- and I'm Corby. sorry, it's my fault. Oh, no, no. <laughs> you, so was, your talk was fantastic. And Corby, will do a few more questions. Thank you. Hi. Um, so- one question that often comes up in support group is um, how do you detox from post chemo? Yeah, it's a really good question. I also get asked that a lot. I think there's not many things that you can personally do at home to necessarily detox. Um, so the best thing that we can do to kind of remove the toxins from our body and stuff will be staying hydrated, flushing everything out. So whether it's chemo, whether it's radiation, um, but really increasing your hydration and water to kind of um, flush it all out. Exercising too. I know that I keep talking about that, but I, I don't think there's great research on this, but I genuinely believe that exercising when you're sweating, you are also releasing toxins and that's helpful for so many different things. Um, so not necessarily like a detox per se, but I think really just kind of doing your best to live an overall healthy lifestyle. So doing those dietary modifications, exercising, and just talking to your team about managing all of these symptoms, but really just being as healthy as you can, I think is the best, the best thing that we can do right after treatment and our whole lives, but especially right after treatment. Okay. Thank you. And can you give us um, some experience? your experience on cold caps. I know they're not a hundred percent effective, mm -hmm. but is it worth to save 50% of our hair? Good question. Um, I can't personally say if it's worth it or not. I think, you know, studies, the companies will tell you that it works. The research will say, we don't know. What I've personally seen is probably what's most common is that people will lose, they'll have a lot of hair thinning. They don't lose all of their hair. Um, that's what I see personally. However, I've seen many people using cold caps and they lose all of their hair. I've also seen people <laughs> use cold caps and they don't lose any hair and it looks like they never even went through treatment. And so that's the really tough thing about cold caps for me. It's really hard to make a recommendation, especially because they are so expensive. Um, but I have seen a lot of movement happening right now of people really working and pushing with insurance companies to actually start getting them covered or at least partially covered. So I think that that will be really important. The other thing to note about cold caps too, is that it can be really uncomfortable. So you wear this ice helmet for your whole entire treatment. It's like brain freeze. Um, so I think it's really kind of personalized and a personalized decision. Uh, but I, it's hard to make a decision kind of, or a recommendation one way or the other, because I've just seen such varied results. Okay. But we're working on insurance coverage. So hopefully stay tuned. 
Okay. Uh, thank you. And so, all right, now I'm trying, I'm trying to find something that you didn't answer. So, um, oh, this, this is one. Can you talk a little bit about blood clots related to treatment? Um, yes. Yeah, so, um, that could be, um, a big question. And so sometimes radiation, we can notice blood and that can be kind of old blood clots. Um, so that is one way that we can have blood clots. If you're on like a hormonal therapy, like let's say you still have a uterus and you're on a hormonal therapy right now, treating your cancer, we can also see blood clots that way too. Um, so it, it it's tough, but I think the the big thing would be to really make sure you're having a good pelvic exam so your provider can see exactly where it's coming from. So is it your bladder? Is it urinary in nature? Is it coming from your uterus or is it vaginally? So, you know, if you have a history of uterine cancer and you have your uterus removed, if you start having blood clots again, 100%, we need to know about that. Um, but clots and bleeding can also just be from scar tissue. So some people have scar tissue kind of piled up. Of course, we kind of talked about that. Um, and then let's say you have intercourse or let's say, you know, you just have, it's extra hot out, extra dryness, whatever. And you might notice bleeding with that, which is fine. It might just be from the scar tissue. We can put a little solution on it to treat it. Um, but I think if you are noticing any bleeding, just talk to your team so they can see exactly where it's coming from and then manage appropriately. Okay. Um, well, I have to, I guess the time is coming to the end. Um, thank you so much, Jessica, for your thoughtful and very thorough answers to these many questions. Also, please make sure to check Cher's website for upcoming educational programs and events and support groups. You can join the conversation also on our online uterine cancer forum, Health Unlocked. And don't forget to follow us on social media. So this concludes today's webinar. Uh, thank you again, Jessica, uh, for this terrific presentation. And I hope that everyone has a great afternoon and weekend. Take care. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for coming. Thank you.